when you look at this thing, I mean, uh, I mean, this is right out of a television show, right? You, I mean, you see this thing, there's a lot of bizarre circumstances here. Florida authorities make a gruesome discovery as they find a body in a burning car. Now investigators believe it's the body of a woman who was carjacked in broad daylight. Last week, Catherine Altagracia Guerrero de Aguas Visas was driving her car when she stopped at a red light in Seminole County, Florida. At the light, an armed gunman held her up at gunpoint, forcing their way into the white Dodge Durango. The terrifying carjacking was captured on cell phone footage from a witness in the vehicle behind the two cars. According to Seminole County Sheriff Dennis Lemma, the gunman exited the green Acura, which was directly behind the victim's vehicle. The gunman was wearing a black hoodie, a ski-type mask, and carrying what appeared to be an automatic handgun consistent with a 10 millimeter. Points directly at the driver, Catherine, uh, tells her, we suspect, to unlock the door, What she does. He jumps in the rear uh, passenger seat behind the driver, and she immediately makes a U-turn. When the light turned green, Catherine made a U-turn. The green Acura followed behind. Probably heading, speculation here, but probably heading in a direction where, where the suspect does not want them to go. And we suspect that he orders her to turn around again and reapproach the intersection of East Lake and Tuscola Road. Uh, at that intersection, they turn south and they're heading southbound, nearly rush hour traffic here, uh, southbound on Tuscola Road towards the Seminole Orange County line, all the way down to Aloma. When they get to Aloma, they make a left. They go all the way across all lanes of traffic so they can get on 417 southbound. At this time, we suspect that Catherine is still driving under the armed uh, dictatorship of the suspect. Here's where you're gonna go, here's where you're gonna drive. The sheriff said Catherine then started driving toward a new construction area where they believed the suspects were familiar with. Nearly two hours after the carjacking was captured on video, deputies were called to that exact area, tragically, for a horrific update. Uh, that was set off in a little bit of a distance, but not so far away that eyewitnesses could not report hearing gunshots and ultimately the smoke of a fire that was set ablaze. Uh, the vehicle that was set ablaze. Uh, by the time authorities uh, with the Osceola County Sheriff's Office arrived there, there was so much damage to the vehicle, you could not positively identify the vehicle, uh, but they also discovered that one person was deceased and found in that vehicle. Now it's important part, part here because we believe that to be the vehicle and the decedent to be Catherine, but we have to positively confirm that through the scientific method of, of uh, DNA examinations and, and dental records. But from all accounts of looking at the scene, it looks like the vehicle and is consistent to everything that we, we've seen so far. Authorities say a dozen shell casings were found at the scene from 10 millimeter rounds. Prior to the carjacking, Catherine called her husband to tell him that someone rammed into the back of her car and was following her. About a half a mile or so prior to that intersection, she started to noticed that the green uh, Acura was behind her and the Acura was actually ramming into her back bumper at that time. At that time, she picked up the phone and called her husband, uh, told her husband that she was being rammed, that there was somebody there that was following her. The husband provided the advice to don't stop, don't stop anywhere. Uh, there are no known reports to the sheriff's office or policing authorities uh, made by either uh, Catherine or the husband that we're aware of. And the sheriff said the suspect knew exactly who they were following and what they were doing. Uh, we are again still putting together to try to explain a motive. There's no uh, criminal history here for either Catherine or her husband uh, in the United States. There's no clear uh, indicator why somebody would do this, why would, would they target them. But we do feel and believe because uh, she was being followed. Uh, they were watching that. Uh, she called her husband. Husband said, don't leave the car. No reports to law enforcement that this was not a random act of violence, that the perpetrators knew exactly who they were going after, uh, why they were going after them is something that is a part of our ongoing, uh, continuing investigation at this time. 
Many questions remain a mystery, but here's what else we know. Investigators believe Catherine, who lives in South Florida, traveled to Central Florida shortly after noon last Thursday and arrived in Seminole County a few hours later. Uh, we know at around 2 o'clock, uh, the vehicle was seen traveling northbound in Jupiter, and she came into Seminole County through downtown Orlando in I-4. Uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon is when she is arriving here. Uh, she stops at a Seminole County gas station. Uh, it was a Shell gas station located just south of 436 in 1792. Uh, she pulls in there, pumps gas, uh, stays there for approximately eight minutes. She travels from that location heading northbound on 1792 uh, into Seminole County and then ultimately gets into Castleberry and turns down Button Road and weaves through the back streets on East Lake through Winter Springs. Uh, about a half a mile before the intersection of East Lake Drive and Tuscawilla Road, and that's the location of the intersection that the video was released on. And while Catherine called her husband to tell him she was being followed, she did not call 911 before she was kidnapped. Uh, you know, anytime something like this happens, we always encourage 911 is like a, it, an absolute, you want authorities, you want somebody there. Um, but I, I can't explain why this would occur a half a mile before the intersection that she would call her husband. Her husband would say, don't stop. I could see somebody saying, don't stop, you know, but to not call 911 uh, is, is something that, um, that again, I don't know the answer to that. Sure. Um, if it was me, I'm, I'm going to call 911 or I'm going to encourage my family and friends to call 911. That did not happen in this case. At the time, investigators were on the search for the green Acura the attackers used during Catherine's carjacking. But in another twist, investigators now say they found the car and believe it's connected to another murder of a Florida tow truck driver. Uh, the first is we're no longer looking for a green 2002 Acura. We've located that vehicle. Uh, the circumstances leading up to that are one that I'll describe out now that uh, the car was legitimately owned uh, by a family in Winter Springs. Uh, they sold that to a legitimate car dealership back in December. Sold the car or traded the car in. As car dealerships typically do, they traded off to an auto auction, it went to an auto auction, and then ultimately was purchased by a buy here, pay here owner operator who sold it from their lot uh, in Seminole County. Uh, they sold it. It was still titled to the original owners in Winter Springs. It had not had enough time for the, to work out the transfer of title. And the people who purchased the car never came back to finish the additional paperwork. Uh, they still owed uh, the person money. So the car uh, has been out on the streets probably since February, unregistered, um, undocumented with a license plate, uh, any license plate that it had on at any given time was just temporarily put on, largely from a stolen tag. What's unique about a 2002 Green Acura in the state of Florida, there were only three in the state of Florida. Uh, two had been salvaged and only one existed uh, in the state. When we look at records, uh, the first time authorities came in contact with this, was when it was towed on March 19th from an Orlando apartment complex. Uh, the car was backed in, parked illegally, uh, probably had no tag on it at the time, and it was towed from an Orange County apartment complex on March 19th. The tow truck driver of that uh, particular tow of this vehicle was a murder victim in Orange County that happened one day before our kidnapping murder. Witness the lies. I didn't lie to you on that polygraph, I promise. The cover-ups. I could see his brain on his... The moments they confessed. I grabbed one of the kitchen knives. I killed him. Outrageous police interrogations. I know, I forgot the head. I wanted the head. You have to see to believe. Oh my God. Law and crime interrogations. Subscribe today. Investigators learned the driver of the tow truck was 39-year-old Juan Luis Centron Garcia. He was shot and killed about a month later on April 10th. Uh, at that scene, a green vehicle matching the description of this green vehicle uh, was located. 
and there was more than 100 rounds fired at that location. One of the rounds found at the scene were 10 millimeter rounds, which is again, uh, an incredibly unique and uncommon round for us to see out on the streets. Sheriff Lemma said Garcia's death is still under investigation, but says he absolutely believes Garcia and Catherine's deaths are connected. I absolutely think they're connected, when, but we'll have to have physical evidence that absolutely proves that. When that shooting happened on Wednesday, and again, there's a lot of moving parts here, so I want to make sure for clarity. That car wasn't on the scene in Taft last Wednesday. That car was towed two or three weeks before then, right? And then released. So what we have, and I don't want to get too far into the Orange County investigation, although they are working hand in glove with, with our detectives here, but a green vehicle was seen at that location. It seems like it was towed back in March, ultimately released on the scene of this particular crime. Uh, so we, we think the green vehicle was there at the murder scene. But the case took yet another turn. An Orange County deputy was arrested on Sunday. He's now charged with five felonies after being accused of leaking details about the investigation to Catherine's husband. Deputy Francisco Australia is accused of not only leaking the investigation details, but also leaking the lead detective's home address. Uh, you know, we know that, or we believe that they were childhood friends. Uh, uh, of course, there was a relationship with their, but what they had to gain is something that, um, that I'm incredibly interested in. Why would somebody do this? Why would they uh, uh, put their own job and, and, and life on the line to, to communicate with one of our detectives, to give an alias in the process? Now, he's, he's been an Orange County deputy for one year, but to give an alias in the process, never knowing that, that Miguel, the decedent's husband, is going to release his phone, that we, uh, if he didn't release the phone, I don't know we would ever know this. So this is, uh, it's incredibly frightening. And, uh, but, but I suspect we'll find a lot more about this as, as the investigation goes on. Deputy Estrella was placed on leave without pay pending an investigation. But his arrest added another layer of mystery to the case. If, if any of this is true, he's not getting the job back. He's gonna lose his ticket, meaning he won't be a law enforcement officer ever again in any jurisdiction. So I gotta believe he's probably thinking it's not, it wasn't worth it to do this. I spoke with Palm Beach County State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg. His office has no affiliation with the case, but he says the sight of the deputy in a jumpsuit and steel bracelets is shocking. You have to know doing this is illegal. You have to know that by getting involved in a murder investigation and trying to impede justice that you're going to get in trouble. It's like, why throw away everything for this? It's, it's so bizarre. I, I, I can't answer it. I, I have no idea why a trained law enforcement officer would get involved in a murder investigation where the guy who could be the main suspect is asking for help to identify personal information, including the home address of the detective who is investigating his wife's murder doesn't make any sense to me. And hopefully things will come into focus sometime soon. While the sheriff mentioned Catherine's husband has been cooperative and not a person of interest, the sheriff believes her husband hasn't been entirely truthful. As many questions still linger, one of the biggest remaining questions, why was Catherine even in Seminole County? Well, we have no idea why she's here. We know that she was here for less than an hour. We have no evidence of her ever being in Seminole County. Uh, ever before. We believe that uh, she was absolutely targeted and, and, and followed to a certain extent, to a certain point. And, and I think that one of the most important things that, that for us to get out on Friday was this was not a random act of violence that occurred, that she absolutely was targeted. Uh, why she was targeted, I think, is something that uh, our detectives are working aggressively to be able to answer that question. Uh, of course, when you're in this business, you have speculations. You have hunches, you have feelings, uh, but you never let those arrive at the lectern before you can uh, put some evidence behind it. So again, they're, they're going to turn every rock over to find out. But quite frankly, I think he knows a lot more than what he shared, right? Uh, you don't have your wife communicate with you that you're getting rammed by a car and go two hours without calling anybody. So he has cooperated. He has provided information. I think the initial story was that she was up here to visit family members. I don't know that we believe that. Um, uh, he did give his cell phone, which I'm 
incredibly grateful because we would not have known about the Orange County deputy, at least not yet, if, if he did not do that. But I think that there's a lot more blanks that he could help uh, fill in about the circumstances involving uh, this particular crime and now uh, potentially other crimes. And while at this time it's unclear how many suspects are involved or even who they are, as Ehrenberg explains, the crime appears to be organized and well thought out, but still a lot of questions are left unanswered. If the husband says she's visiting family, but she doesn't apparently have family there. So why? This is not a place you just get lost. This is a place four, four and a half hours away from where you live. So it looked like someone was tracking her who knew where she would be and then who committed this atrocity in broad daylight, a carjacker with guns, and then take her to an empty area where they apparently knew what was going on just to murder her. Generally with carjackings, it's about stealing the car. It's about stealing the victim's possessions. It's not about executing someone and then burning all the evidence. Plus the fact that this car was a car that was taken from a, a, a lot that was a tow lot and the tow driver was murdered. I mean, there was a lot going on here. A lot of trails of, of blood and evidence that will, I think, eventually lead to an arrest. It shows a level of depravity, but it also shows a level of organization. Like when you see mafia movies, you know, when they shoot a hundred times and not thinking they're going to get caught and they're, I mean, look for what to get their car back that they needed apparently to commit more crimes. Because well, otherwise, why would you go commit the heinous crime of murder where you could be given the death penalty, but for the fact that you needed that unregistered car to commit this next crime, which you may have been paid for or for whatever reason, it doesn't look like there's any motive to carjack and murder this poor woman unless someone is paying you. It doesn't look like it was anything stolen or it just her body was eviscerated in the fire from the car and all the bullets. And it's just, it's an awful case. And you just hope that justice will be done. But I think uh, the law enforcement is on top of this. Authorities have still not determined a motive for the killings. At this time, the suspects are still on the loose. Seminole County Sheriff Dennis Lemma says the suspects are to be considered armed and dangerous and is asking the public to not approach them, but call law enforcement with either the Orange County Sheriff's Office or Seminole County Sheriff's Office. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Elizabeth Milner.